Okay, so, right, so in, in the 50s and in the 60s, there were a lot of successes. There were chess computers, computers proving the geometrical theorems, etc. And then they got, in a sense, too ambitious, tried with machine translation and everything, and it didn't work as well. And in the end of the 60s, the, the successes were sort of fading, fading away and nothing really happened. And uh, definitely, there were still no thinking machines in the strong sense that was expected or, uh, or promised. So the result, of course, is great disappointment in the, in the community. And actually, very dramatically, in the 73, the British government decided to cancel all support to research in AI uh, based on a report that concluded in no part of the field have discoveries made so far produced the major impact that was then promised, okay? So that's, that'll teach you not to promise too much. So of course, the researchers were too naive and promised too much and it, and it failed. And this uh, then resulted in a sense in a long winter of AI. So in the 70s and beginning of the 80s, not a lot of things were happening in AI. Now, then from the end of the 80s and onwards, uh, AI comes to life again, but, but in a different way, since now people have learned from this lesson, from this AI bubble that, that, that bursted, that, okay, we need to be more realistic, and uh, let's for a moment just uh, forget about trying to, uh, to make computers that act exactly as humans, but we'll just take what we can get and at least try to make computers solve some of the problems that, that, that otherwise uh, were only the, the domain of humans. So some, some notable examples here are in, uh, in, uh, in 91, uh, the US defense uh, was using a planning system to deal with uh, the very complicated logistics in the Gulf War. And uh, it was stated that the money they saved on using this system was more than was spent on AI research ever from, from the beginning of AI up to that point. So everything was paid back just by that one, one uh, instance. In 94, uh, the first driverless car was driving uh, 1,000 kilometers on public roads in France. Now driverless cars are becoming more and more so widespread. In 97, uh, the IBM chess computer Deep Blue uh, was uh, becoming world uh, champion by beating uh, Gary Kasparov. In 2001, uh, a computer was winning a competition on stock trading, and it wasn't competing only against computers. It was competing against teams where some of them were computers and some of them were teams of, of uh, uh, very talented uh, human stock traders. And then this year, uh, we had uh, Watson, another IBM computer that uh, was beating the, uh, the best, uh, best, uh, the world best uh, uh, people on, uh, on Jeopardy. Okay, so, so it seems good, so it, it ends good, but in a sense, uh, there, there, there might be still a, a problem or disappointment here, because uh, in a sense, the AI that we see today or in the 90s and the zeros are no more thinking machines in the strong sense than the AI of the 50s and the 60s. So I can give you an example. So Deep Blue, the chess, chess computer, uses the same strategy, exactly the same strategy as was used by, 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 by the chess computers of the 50s and the 60s. So what it does is that it, it uh, it simply brute force computes all the possible moves and, uh, and then by computing a whole lot of moves it looks at all these possible moves and then it maximizes a simple uh, function that, that uh, tells it that this is, the best, this is the best way to go. So from a mathematical viewpoint or computer science viewpoint what is happening here is really simple and when you look at it you say okay this is not intelligence this is just a this is just an algorithm that runs on a computer or, an, or a slightly advanced computer program. But what happened from the 50s and the 60s and up till the, uh, uh, the, the 90s what that was that we got an, a dramatic increase in computational power. So in Deep Blue, there were 500 specially designed chess processors, and these were able to compute 200 million moves per second. And this is the way that, that Deep Blue was able to beat Gary Kasparov, not by, in a sense, as we would feel it being more intelligent by being able to think abstractly and have a good understanding of chess, but by following a, 
a simple algorithm where it just calculated an enormous amount of, of moves. So the, the strategies of, of the computer and the, the, the human are, are completely different here. And of course, this might give you some bit of disappointment because this is not really what we expected when we thought about AI and the, 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 all the, the good things that, that AI could give us. And Gary Kasparov himself uh, has some, I think, very good quotes on this that were uh, published in Huffington Post uh, last year. So uh, he says, the AI crowd too was pleased with the result and the attention but dismayed by the fact that Deep Blue was hardly what their predecessors had imagined decades earlier when they dreamed of creating a machine to defeat the world chess champion. Instead of a computer that thought and played chess like a human, with human creativity and intuition, they got one that played like a machine, systematically evaluating 200 million possible moves on the chessboard per second and winning with brute number crushing force. And then later, Deep Blue was only intelligent the way your programmable alarm clock is intelligent, not that losing $10 million to alarm clock made me feel any better. <laughs> and actually, the, so, so, so Deep Blue is one instance of it, but, but actually when you look at most examples of AI, then, then you would say in a sense that, that we, we, we're faced with some conflict, conflicting emotions that because when we look at what the AI can do, we're generally impressed. So Deep Blue is impressive. Watson also is impressive. But when we are told what's inside it and what, how it does it, then we tend to be disappointed because it's not what we expected. So it, it, in a sense, it, 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 it plays on a, it, 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 it plays on a, on a different uh, level than we do. It does, uses a completely different strategy, like this mouse here, that we want it to go through the labyrinth, but it just eats its way through, right? This is not what we expected. Um, right, okay, so, so, so let's now uh, make a thought experiment. So let's return to the Turing machine. Now, what then if uh, an artificial intelligence system finally passed the Turing test? Would we then be impressed and convinced? And would we then say, okay, now we know that we have artificial intelligence in the real sense? Now, actually, it's not, it's not really clear whether this is the case. Actually, it's not, not necessarily so. Because if you think about what a computer is, then it's a, it's a machine that does some bit flipping. It flips uh, ones into zeros and zeros into ones, and it follows a very strict recipe. So it has this computer program which tells it exactly what to do at exactly which point in time. And any computer is uh, like that, no matter how we program it, it is, it is like it, that is how it works in, in the inside. And so in principle, we can simulate any computer program as a human by just using pen and paper because we could put zeros and one, we would need a fairly large piece of paper in order to do it, but we could put the zeros and one of, of, on a piece of paper and we could manually follow these, uh, this strict recipe that is in the program of the computer. So we as humans would be able to simulate this computer even if it was a computer that passed the Turing test, we would able, be able to simulate it with pen and paper just flipping bits. But, so where's the thinking and where's the understanding and where, where are the mental states in, in doing that? It seems so uh, much less than what we humans do, right? So even if we have a computer that passes the Turing test, we might look at the program and say, ah, oh, okay, it's just that, I, I was expecting something more here. Of course, an imp important question is here whether we humans are just, I mean, whether we can be reduced to computer programs in this sense or whether we can. And this, it's not clear whether, whether it's, it's, it's the case or not, but, but it actually it might be the case that we can make a computer that simulates the, all the neurological processes in our brains. And, and if it does so, it would behave as a human brain. Right, so, so to give some characteristics of the, the current state of affairs in, uh, in AI, then um, we can say that uh, one of the, the features that, that we have today is that, that the artificial intelligence is uh, much more domain-specific than generic. 
So the, the AI systems we have today, they solve a ve very limited uh, 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 problems, very specific problems. So we have computers that can play chess and that can drive a car and that can uh, play Jeopardy and all sorts of things. But these computers only do that, right? And uh, so we don't, have, we don't have the generic artificial intelligence. We don't have a personal assistant that we uh, buy in a shop and we put it into, uh, into our apartment and then, we are, then it asks, so, okay, so what would you like me to do here? And we learn it how to cook food and uh, wash the floors and then it, it'll do all that. And we say, okay, what, what about playing a game of chess? And it says, I don't know how. And then we say, okay, but let, let me show you how the rules are and then, then we're going to play. We're no, nowhere near that at, at this moment. And also, current AI is characterized by these simple algorithms, rather sort of simple ideas, but that are then combined with a very, very large amount of, of raw computational power, which means that they can actually impress, in what they, uh, impress us in what they do, but not necessarily in how they do it. And, and AI with sort of higher cognitive abilities and really is sort of um, being able to, to think abstractly, we don't really have that on a very high level uh, yet. So in short, AI outsmarts us on raw computational power, but not on, on, on cognitive abilities. Right. So, so an obvious question here is, will, uh, will it just continue this way? as it is currently. So will the future of AI just be this, that we continue having more and more computational power available, but we still use rather simple algorithms, and it means that the computers will then uh, in any way be, just uh, become smarter and smarter or can, can solve more problems. I don't think this is the case at all, actually. And I think one, one proof uh, that, that I like a lot is that uh, if you take the best human chess player and combine it with the best uh, existing uh, chess computer, then if they play as a pair, then they will play much better than any number of computers you can put together as a team. And why is this? Well, it's because the, 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 the forces or the strengths of the human and the computer are different. The computer can compute uh, uh, way more possible moves than the human can. But the human has this abstract understanding of the game of, of chess that the, the computer doesn't have. So when you combine these two, then your human can use the computer to, to calculate some possibilities that is too difficult for the human to, to do in a short while, and then he can combine it with his own understanding of the game. And this means that there's still, a long, uh, there's still, there's still something to be achieved in terms of chess computers, because eventually, then we would uh, like them to be able to play just as good as this combination of a human and a chess computer. And as, as long as they don't, they're not at the level of, of human chess players, in a sense, right? And also, I see hi these higher cognitive abilities, the abstract thinking, the, uh, the ability to generalize, and also something like this theory of mind that I was talking about, the ability to put yourself into other people's shoes. All these higher cognitive abilities I find to be sort of essential to the, the holy grail of AI, which is to make generic AI, that is artificial intelligence, which is not domain specific, which is not tied to one particular problem that, that it can solve. But we are really far from being there yet. So we work on it. And, and, and uh, so, so this is one of the things I'm working on. And of course, there are a lot of people working on this. So getting AI to, to the next level by, by, by putting some of these higher cognitive abilities into them. But it's just that when we look at the successes that AI have, then these are not the successes, at least not yet. The successes are in combining simple methods with a lot of computational power. But I think we will see this in the, in the future. So one question that, that people often have is uh, whether robots will eventually uh, take over over the world and and so I actually don't know so I can't give you uh, any proof that they will or they won't and uh, at least I, I can I can tell you that it won't happen anytime soon 
And, and a very good proof of this is that, uh, well, they, there is not yet a single AI system that has proven to be able to so solve problems that were significantly different from those it was, was programmed for. So a, a simple example here is that Watson is not playing chess and Deep Blue is not playing Jeopardy. And we can't teach them to do it either. And this is because of, of the way they, the, the architecture of them are, right? So in a sense, we are, we are impressed by all the things that we can do already now with AI, but since they're not working in any way in the same way as the human mind does, then they're not in the same way able to learn new things and, and move into new domains. They are tied to very specific uh, domains that they work in. Now, okay, so, so one question uh, that was, in a sense, uh, the starting point of all of this is that, um, so the question was, uh, is artificial intelligence possible? And, uh, well, first of all, you must ask, what, what, do you, what do you mean when you say artificial intelligence, right? So do you mean artificial intelligence in terms of, of of, of playing chess or something like this, or do you mean artificial intelligence on a sci-fi grade? So, so things that are more or less indistinguishable from humans in, in, the, in the kind of problems they can solve and the way that they solve them. Uh, so an obvious question is, are there any fundamental limits to what we can achieve with, uh, with AI? And as much as I would like to give you an answer, I can't. And, I, I, and, and you shouldn't believe anyone who says they can, because there is no convincing proof. Yet there are a lot of suggestions that either say, OK, so there is no limit, or there is a limit, but there's no convincing proof of either. One, one answer that you might come up with, and that sounds feasible, is that in a sense, you, you might say AI will never solve problems requiring real intelligence, right? Because we didn't really see this yet. We didn't see it in Deep Blue, and we didn't see it in, uh, in Watson either. It's, it's simply, re it's still reducing what, is, what it, it's doing is it can, can still be reduced to some fairly simple uh, mathematical calculations. But the problem with this, uh, this question is, uh, or the problem with this answer is that it's not even obvious what we mean when we say real intelligence. And this is actually a concept that seems to be drifting. Because whenever we have a computer that does a new thing, then we look at this and say, ah, oh, but that was, okay, it turned out that this problem didn't require real intelligence. So before we had chess computers, we would say chess is really tough, we need real intelligence to play chess. And then we had test computers. And then we looked at how they did it, and we say, ah, OK, I was wrong. It doesn't really require real intelligence to play chess. You can just do a, a, a whole lot of calculations. And then with Watson, we probably also didn't expect that there would be a computer that could win Jeopardy, because uh, there's, there's a lot of things involved here also with natural language understanding. But then when we see it and we see how it's implemented, we say, ah, OK, I can see how that could happen. And you, you have this very great database, and you match the words in the, in, the, in, the, in the sentence with the database, and you find some match. Oh, OK, OK, so it turned out that this doesn't require real intelligence either. So what, what our notion of real intelligence are, 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 are drifting all the, all, the, all the time. And also, as I was addressing uh, previously, even if we have a computer that passes the Turing test, we might feel that we are a bit cheated because it might be doing it on a completely different uh, premise than, 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 than we do as uh, humans. Uh, right. So, I, unfortunately, I'm not going to give you the final answer to the question of whether we will ever achieve sci-fi grade AI. So again, this is one of the things that we can't really give either a proof or disproof. But it's quite obvious, I hope, from what you've seen, that we are no way and, uh, close to that goal yet. We don't have generic AI. We don't have chatbots that can convince humans that they are human or, or even close. But then as, as, as the atmosphere in the 80s and 90s, we, we must just think that, okay, we take what we can get, we see how far we can get with this, and we can get really far. And I think 
what will happen in the future now is that AI will proceed in that direction of, of trying to have these higher cognitive abilities in the computers, even though, of course, that is very difficult and, and very demanding uh, on, on computational uh, resources. But I also think it's quite, it's quite certain that AI will significantly change our everyday lives and it will do it probably to a larger, maybe even a much larger extent than what uh, the computer and the internet has already done. And I have these pre pictures uh, because I want to sort of give you the image that uh, from my viewpoint I think that we are still uh, on a, in a very early stage in terms of AI. So this is an example of an early computer. This is one of the first internet station. And I think when we talk about AI and computers, it's still it's in its infancy. And when we look at it, then uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of the level we're at. And uh, well, final, some final words here. Um, so the question about whether AI, at least in the strong sense, so the understanding thinking machines is possible, it's also a very difficult question at this point of time, in the same way as if I was here in the 1800s and was asked to give a talk on, uh, is space traveling possible? Then what would I answer? I would say, okay, so we don't have physical evidence that it should be impossible. On the other hand, what we have in terms of technology is now nowhere near uh, re uh, ma making this uh, in into the real thing. And so, so, so it would be impossible to, to answer that with any kind of certainty. But we got it in the end. So you might think that I'm now here suggesting that we will also have this sci-fi great AI in the end. And maybe uh, we will, but, but uh, maybe we won't. So there's, uh, there's uh, room for, for discussing this uh, over a couple of cocktails. Thank you. <laughs> Now we have time for two questions, and after that, you can just approach Thomas at the bar. Um, from what I see, um, you're telling us something about the history of the computer. Mm -hmm. But if we speak about um, artificial intelligence and look at the raw material materials, then maybe artificial intelligence is not necessarily numerical or based on algorithms from what we know as a computer. Um, what about imitating biology or, right. you know, that sort of artificial intelligence? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's uh, I think the notion of artificial intelligence has sort of decided that this is what you, considers artificial intelligence, namely to try to implement intelligence in a, in a discrete computer doing numerical computations. Uh, but of course, there's very interesting perspectives in having something which is uh, working in the continuous domain or biological something. Uh, uh, but, but, but we haven't really seen any of that yet. Uh, so, so, and it might be that when, if it comes, then it will, it might have a different name. But also, a, a thing I would like to, to, to mention here is that, that, uh, so it might, for instance, so if we do it biologically, it might be a bit like cloning. So we could also clone humans. And it could also be that we could do this in a sense in a computer by simulating all the neurological processes in a computer. But I'm not sure that would satisfy us because we wouldn't understand what we were doing. So we, it wouldn't get us closer to an understanding of what intelligence really is. And we perhaps would be able to copy existing brains and clone them. So make sort of uh, virtual clones of human brains. But then it also means that if you, if you ask, uh, if you then want to have such a clone as your personal assistant, you ask it, uh, please, please uh, vacuum the floors, and it will say, no, I, I'd rather watch television, right? <laughs> and you can't do anything about that because what you have been doing is just copying. So, so I think also an important point here is that at the same time as, as we are trying, in a sense, to simulate or be inspired by human intelligence, 
Uh, I, I also, one of the goals here is to try to understand what intelligence is, and hopefully, in, in, uh, as a result of this research, we will get closer to, to a deeper understanding of what, what, what we are ourselves are, even if we are something completely different from a computer. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, no, I don't see it, so it's probably me. Uh, no, okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for a great uh, presentation. I have <clears throat> the, the thing is that you, the premise for measuring intelligence is the Turing test, and it comes up in all your slides. Yeah, yeah. Now, assume that you have this smart chimpanzee who wants to measure intelligence, and it would probably say it has to eat bananas like a monkey and walk like a monkey. Yeah. And then suddenly it sees this strange animal coming out of the forest, which is a human being, and it. This human being doesn't eat bananas like a monkey, it doesn't walk like a monkey, so it cannot be intelligent. Right. <laughs> so the question is, are we measuring artificial intelligence in a wrong way by using the Turing test? For instance, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned um, Kasparov saying that basically this is just a raw computing machine. Yeah. However, Kasparov had his own computer advisor, Friedrich Friedel, who says in New York Times, that this is a different form of intelligence. It's not the sort of intelligence we're used to, but it's as if this machine uses tactical computation, computational power, and it becomes strategy. Yeah. So, I mean, is the Turing test basically, is it more sort of culture and traditionalism within the scientific community, or do you think it is the way to test right. scientific intelligence? Yeah, okay, so... so yeah, so, so I actually also considered talking a bit about whether the Turing test is even relevant, and, and then, but I didn't have time to do it. So, so this can, of course, be discussed in the same way as, as, uh, as uh, in, in the beginning of uh, aviation, people were trying to fly by mimicking birds, right? They were jumping out of cliffs with flapping things on their arms, and they were all killed. And, uh, and, and it only really got into its stride when they forgot about all this and looked at the basic physical laws and the laws of the aerodynamics and tried to build something that could fly based on that. And, and you, might have the same, uh, you might have the same point here that the Turing test might not be that relevant. On the other hand, uh, in, in the example you give with the monkey and the human, then, 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 then the right thing would be that the monkey says to the human, I'm going to test you now you should act as a, as a monkey and, and try to behave as a monkey. And if, it's, if the human is significantly more intelligent, I, I guess it would be able to. So you could also say, in a sense, if, 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 the, if you can make computers that are more intelligent than humans, then they, they, would, they would probably be able to pass the Turing test because they would say, okay, oh, I'm going to pretend I'm a human for a while. Uh, but... but, but um, I mean, this is really low level for me, but, but okay, I'll do it. Uh, but, but, but you're right, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear that this is the right, but it's, it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's nice in a way because it's very well defined and all other ways of trying to measure uh, uh, intelligence or artificial intelligence are much more weak than this. This is very clear cut, and, yeah. But it's not the full story. Okay, so thank you. Um, you can uh, continue asking Thomas questions at the bar just now. And uh, after that, we'll have the concert by uh, Hatten Nordfjord. <laughs> and, uh, but before, 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 uh, before we go into that, I just want to tell you that in two weeks, we'll have a talk about quantum teleportation by Eugene Polzig from the Niels Bohr Institute. So that should be really nice. Uh, and uh, in the next uh, two weeks, we'll have Rupert Sheldrake, if you know who he is. He's a very famous biologist from England who is coming all the way from England to Christiania just for this talk. And it's going to be about morphogenetic fields and if the physical laws can be inherited, if there is a memory and things just behave because they're used to behave like that. So let's give another applause to Thomas. <laughs> with the concert in five minutes. Yeah.